Tim Devine and his Irish had left ten opponents green with envy and were in a position to make wise men out of the forecasters. A late change in the schedule gave the Irish a crucial test at the outset. They had to face defending national champion Pittsburgh. And even without Heisman Trophy winner Tony Dorsett, the Panthers proved to be a superb team in 1977. Despite outstanding effort by the Notre Dame defense, Pitt jumped off to an early 9-0 lead. But quarterback Rusty Lish started the Irish on the move. Chris Haynes made this reception, one of 10 Lish completed in 18 attempts. Lish then connected with two-time All-America Ken McAfee for the first of the season, one which brought the Irish within three points. It was then up to the defense to contain the Panthers, and that they did. Over the final three quarters, Notre Dame limited the explosive pit offense to a mere 29 yards. Ross Browder, college football's most decorated lineman, batted away this lateral and made the crucial recovery. Reeve capitalized on Browner's efforts by kicking his second field goal of the day for the winning points. By the end of the 1977 season, Reeve would own nearly every kicking record, including field goals, extra points, and kick scoring on a game, season, and career basis. Offensive captain Terry Urich gave the Irish some insurance points for this determined touchdown run behind Ernie Hughes' goal line block. Notre Dame had passed the big test against the seventh-ranked Panthers. Ole Miss opened its season against border rival Memphis State and Southeastern Conference King Alabama. But the team the Rebels had been waiting for was Notre Dame. Bob Golick was an outstanding player for Notre Dame on this disappointing day in Mississippi as the Fighting Irish's hopes for an undefeated season were scotched. This was the beginning of an All-American season for the middle linebacker, one in which he would make 146 tackles to set a Notre Dame record. Unfortunately, that famous Irish luck couldn't find its way to Jackson and the Rebels made behind-the-back catches look routine. Mississippi had pulled off the upset of the year. If the Irish were to bounce back, they would have to do it on the road, this time against intrastate rival Purdue. Freshman quarterback Mark Herman was the talk of the Midwest, and he showed why in the first half. Herman connected on this 37-yard scoring play to Ray Smith, and enough others to give the Boilermakers 24 first-half points. Irish quarterback Rusty Lish tried to keep the Irish close as he hooked up with halfback Terry Urich for his second touchdown of the day. Herman made the mistake of throwing in the direction of Luther Bradley, who has made a habit of shutting down Boilermaker threats. His fourth quarter interception return gave the Irish life. Dan Devine then made a call to his bullpen for the best reliever in college football, Miracle Man Joe Montana. Montana, in turn, looked for Ken McAfee, the man he has learned to count on in clutch situations. You know, when you see a big target like that, it, and you know if you throw the ball anywhere near him, he's, he's going to come down with it. He's just got super hands and he runs super pattern. He's as big as the library. You can't miss him. Just as he had done in 1975 against North Carolina and the Air Force, Montana guided the Irish back from an almost certain defeat. In those two comebacks and this fourth quarter rally, Montana accounted for 52 points, 19 of 26 passes for 417 yards all in the span of only 15 and a half minutes. 
fullback, Dave Mitchell, fought his way into the end zone for the winning score against the Boilermakers. Montana was named UPI Back of the Week for his achievements. And though it was he who had inspired the Irish offense and turned the season around, he credited his teammates for the comeback. They responded very well. The receivers caught the ball, ran super patterns, and the line gave me every bit of time that I needed. In years gone by, Notre Dame and Army played some of the most fabled games in the history of college football. But Rockney, Leahy, Blanchard, and Davis would have been stunned at the gadgets in New Jersey's Giant Stadium. But it was Jerome Heavens who gave the Irish outside speed from his new halfback position. Running out of the eye formation for the first time, Evans broke the single game rushing mark of 186 yards set by Emil six yard Sitko in 1948. The junior captain elect for 1978 finished the game with 200 yards. The unexpected is commonplace in the colorful Notre Dame Southern Cal series, and Dan Devine might well be remembered for masterminding the cagiest plot of them all. While the Irish were warming up in their traditional blue and gold, Devine secretly had a new green jersey placed in each of the players' lockers. The move turned out to be a Trojan horse for the Irish, who always seemed to be charged up for USC, as Ken McAfee explains. Southern Cal Notre Dame rivalry throughout the years has just been an unbelievable football game. It, it, I think it's up up on top of all the rivalries in the country and uh, you know of course year in and year out the hard hitting contest is just a great football game. The Green Machine sack quarterback Rob Hurdle <laughs> deflected his passes and caused turnovers as the Trojans saw the green jerseys from close range all day. Mark for the Irish on this day was provided by Ted Bergmeier, a candidate for both offensive and defensive player of the game. He ran 21 yards on a fake field goal to set up a touchdown. Intercepted a sure Rob Hurdle to Randy Sermon touchdown pass. and coolly turned a bad snap on an extra point try into two points by scrambling and then passing to flanker Tom Doman, who made the most talked about catch of the day. Joe Montana went to his favorite target, Ken McAfee, eight times. This one good for a 12-yard touchdown. The defense helped with the point production when Bob Golick blocked Marty King's putt. Tackle J.K. scooped it up and rambled 30 yards for a touchdown. The Irish savored their first win over the Trojans since 1973, the same year they won the national championship. If the Irish had visions of a repeat of 1973, they would have done well to recall the close encounter of the worst kind they had with Navy in 1976. Devine reminded his players of that and then pulled one more trick from his green sleeve. Instead of starting conservatively, Devine directed Montana to come out passing. And on the first offensive play, the 1978 Heisman Trophy candidate completed a 48-yard bomb to Chris Haynes. Navy kept the Irish out of the end zone, but two series later, Jerome Heavens followed the blocking of center Dave Huffman and tackled Tim Foley for a 49-yard touchdown run. Linebacker Leroy Leopold ensured the victory with a pass interception that he returned 50 yards for a score.
The green machine was rolling along now and appeared ready to avenge last season's upset loss to Pepper Rogers' Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Joe Montana was set to lead the Irish to their most productive day yet. He threw to Captain Steve Orsini, who took the ball to the Tech one. Montana scored from there. And then in succession, Montana threw touchdown passes to Terry Urich. To Chris Haynes. And this one to Dave Weimer, which netted 68 yards, thanks to some of the fanciest footwork of the 1977 season. Tim Cagle, with help from split end Speedy Hart, became the first freshman quarterback since 1951 to throw a touchdown pass. All in all, the Irish scored 10 touchdowns on 99 offensive plays and picked up 34 first downs. They had truly developed into one of the most potent offensive teams in the nation. They call it Death Valley because to date it has claimed 99 football victims. But the Irish had no intention of letting the 15th ranked Clemson Tigers claw them from their number five position. Ross Browder, who had been named defensive lineman of the week against Georgia Tech, propelled the Irish defense once more. Number 74, Jeff Weston, had one of his best performances as well. The Notre Dame offense got off to a good start too. All-American guard Ernie Hughes cleared the way for Jerome Heavens who culminated a 44-yard drive. But Clemson used its home field advantage to the fullest, and Lester Brown's second touchdown of the day had all the Tiger fans smiling. Down by 10 points late in the third quarter, Vegas Ferguson got Notre Dame into excellent position with a 30-yard rush. However, an offside penalty nullified that game. Two more penalties left the Irish with a second and 31 situation. Montana's 27-yard pass complete to Ken McAfee helped. Another 16-yard toss to McAfee to close the third quarter put Montana in position to score from two yards out. With the penalties, the drive actually covered 119 yards. But the Irish had to get the ball back, and Leroy Leopold and Bob Golick obliged as they forced a fumble. Mike Calhoun recovered at midfield. Montana had been saving a screen pass for just such an occasion, and Vegas Ferguson carried it 36 yards downfield. After an eight-yard burst up the middle by Terry Urick, Montana inched his way in from the one. The Irish had met the Death Valley Challenge and lived to tell about it. The eyes of the Cotton Bowl Association were upon Notre Dame in the regular season home finale. Veteran Ben Martin was coaching his last game for the Air Force Academy, but this was no time for the Irish to give him a going-away present if they planned to go away on January 2nd. Vegas Ferguson didn't waste time as he used the blocks of guard Ted Haransky and in Chris Haynes to score on Notre Dame's first offensive play. Montana then threw a screen pass to Heavens, and he turned it into a 25-yard pickup. scoring his second of three touchdowns. Just before the half ended, Montana threw to Haynes for a 33-yard touchdown. Playing only in the first half, Montana completed 11 of 15 passes for 172 yards. Senior flanker Steve Schmidt scored the first touchdown of his career 
to wrap up a 49 to nothing Notre Dame victory. The sunny climb of Florida lay ahead. A 25-inch snowfall in South Bend during the week didn't exactly prepare the Irish for the playing conditions they would face in Miami in their regular season finale. And though the offense had a tough time turning over early in the game, the defense, led by Captain Willie Fry, made sure Miami did. Two plays later, Vegas Ferguson converted the hurricane mistake into an 11-yard touchdown. Fry put the heat on again, enabling Leroy Leopold to pick off this pass for the third interception touchdown of his young career, a Notre Dame record. Montana rallied the Irish for one more touchdown before the half. This one, a 23-yard strike to Ferguson. Montana connected with Ken McAfee in the end zone for the second time. A catch that required tremendous concentration from the nation's premier tight end. Now the Irish could concentrate on the Cotton Bowl. Notre Dame would have the toughest challenge of all bowl participants, the top-ranked Texas Longhorns. The Texas roster included Heisman Trophy winner Earl Campbell, Outland Trophy winner Brad Shearer, the world's fastest football player, flanker Johnny Lamb Jones, and the nation's top kicker, Russell Erksleben. The Irish hope to end a 12-game Longhorn winning streak and move up to the number one spot in the polls. The Irish offensive line, a prime factor in the team's amazing comeback this season, turned in its best effort of the year. The most talked about matchup was between Notre Dame All-American guard Ernie Hughes, number 65, and Outland winner Brad Shearer, number 77. Hughes won the contest hands down. But number 66, left guard Ted Horansky, also deserves credit. As does number 56, All-America center candidate Dave Huffman. And number 73, left tackle Tim Foley. And of course, number 71, Steve McDaniels. The 6'7", 270-pound right tackle who has given the Irish an effective barricade for three years. Terry Urich turned the blocks of these players into Notre Dame's first touchdown at the start of the second quarter. Three minutes later, Urich was headed toward the end zone again and scored on a 10-yard rush. Joe Montana put the aerial attack to work, and Vegas Ferguson made the catch of the day. The Irish were up 24 to 3. But the Longhorns were explosive enough to come back from any deficit. They scored on a six-play, 68-yard drive in a mere 20 seconds. Heading into the locker room at the half, they appeared to have regained the momentum. The Irish reasserted themselves in the third period, holding the ball for five minutes. Jerome Heavens did his part, and he gained 100 yards for the day. The Notre Dame defense let the Longhorns know that they were still around in the second half as linebacker Steve Heimkreider picked off this pass. Terry Urich, playing the best game ever of his four-year career, earned a critical first down with his second effort. Vegas Ferguson scored on the three-yard rush, a touchdown which virtually clinched the Irish victory. Ferguson wasn't 
through. The speedy sophomore running back gained 102 yards rushing and was named the offensive player of the game. Here, he picked up 26 yards and closed the scoring. The 38-10 Notre Dame mastery opened a nationwide debate about who would be number one. But inside one of the Cotton Bowl dressing rooms, there was no doubt. Say there's a possibility that we won't be voted number one because we're the best football team in the United States. The voters in all four major polls agreed with Divine. UPI, AP, the Football Writers Association, and the National Football Foundation all chose the Irish national champions. The title highlighted a season which must be rated one of Notre Dame's greatest of all time. The Irish broke or tied 37 team and individual records. I don't think there's a better experience in the world than playing football at Notre Dame. I really don't. I think that the charisma involved here, the, the whole atmosphere around campus, you talk about the Golden Dome and everything, it, you get caught up in it. And I think this is a tremendous uh, university. I, I never regret coming here for one minute, and I just think that uh, I wish that everyone could enjoy it as much as I have.